Good morning and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival online. My name is Matt Vidmar and I'm delighted to be introducing today's special session with Dr. Michael Leach. This is the 30th anniversary of Orkney International Science Festival and we're delighted that it is also our first online festival edition. Yes, in part, that is due to the current restriction due to the coronavirus pandemic, but furthermore, we're excited to be able to share the content from Orkney further around the world and to be able to have many more participants joining us for the talks, the discussions and the social events. Today, I'm introducing Michael Leach, who is a wildlife photographer and author. He has traveled to all seven continents and worked with many of the world's most charismatic animals. The list goes on and on, but I'll just mention polar bears in the, uh, in the Arctic, gorillas in Central Africa, lemurs in the Madagascar, sperm whales in the Mid-Atlantic, monkeys in the Amazon, penguins in the Antarctic, and elephants in Kenya. Today, he will share his experience of the Galapagos Islands, which of course first come to the prominence when Charles Darwin reported on his discoveries all those years ago. Michael has visited the islands many times, and he will tell the story of his visits, as well as many details and beautiful photos of its extraordinary wildlife. If you have questions for Michael, please pop them in the chat below the YouTube video. That way we can have a nice discussion after Michael's talk. So over to you, Michael, and take us on a visit to the enchanted Galapagos Islands. Thank you very much and hello to everyone listening. And this time last year, I was actually speaking at the, um, at the Science Festival in Orkney. And it's a little disappointing not being there now, but it's also very exciting to know that anyone in the world can take part in your wonderful festival. As you've heard from the introduction, my job allows me to go literally all over the world, working with some of the most amazing animals on earth. I also give lots of talks. I give talks in many, many, many countries. And usually in the Q&A session after the talk, there are, there are two questions that crop up. What's your favorite animal? And what's your favorite place to visit? Well, I can answer those both quite easily. My favorite animal without doubt is the mountain gorilla. And I lived with mountain gorillas for quite a long time. I've had them sitting on my lap. That's an easy answer. My favorite place is equally easy to re respond to. It's the Galapagos. So many places around the world don't live up to their hype. The tourist guides, the guidebooks say that this is a wonderful place to go. There's lots of wildlife. And when you get there, it's a little disappointing. Things are never usually as good as, as the PR maintains, but the Galapagos is better. <laughs> the Galapagos is the most extraordinary place in the world for anyone interested in wildlife. The very first time I went, I landed on the island of Baltra and I took a taxi through Santa Cruz Island, which is in the middle of the archipelago. And before anything else, I needed to go to the bank to get some money. And I went into the bank. There's 25,000 people live on the Galapagos, and it's not um, um, an uninhabited archipelago. There's a town called Puerto Ayora, and there's a bank there. And I went inside the bank, and there in the bank was an elephant, was a seal, a young female sea lion. Now, I'm not an expert, but I've never known banks with ensuite sea lions at all. And what really caught my attention was the locals, the people in the bank, were paying no attention at all. They were walking around the sea lion. They weren't screaming hysterically. They weren't chasing the seal off with, with broomsticks. You cannot fail to fall in love with a place that treats its wildlife so kindly. So I got my money, went out to the bank, and across the road, there were some benches some benches in front of the beach allowing people to look out into the sea and sitting on the bench were two pelicans and they appeared to be having a conversation. In front of the bench there was a five-year-old child looking into the eyes of an iguana. This place hooked me. It is one of the most extraordinary places in the world. Now the theme for this year's science festival is island magic and this fits perfectly with the Galapagos. Now we call them now the Galapagos Islands but for many years, 
they were known as the Enchanted Islands because when they were first discovered, no one knew they were there. And very often the islands are shrouded with what's called the sea fret, a really dense sea mist. And this covers the whole of the islands. And in those days, navigation wasn't a science. Navigation was kind of hit and miss. So no one quite knew where the islands were. And very often when sailors went back to the islands, they couldn't see them because they were hidden by mist. And it was believed for quite a long time that sometimes they were there and sometimes they weren't. And sometimes they moved. And that's why they got the name Enchanted Islands, the islands of magic. Now I'm sure many of you realize that the Galapagos Islands are in the Pacific Ocean, the world's biggest ocean. They're 600 miles, a thousand kilometers west of the South American continent. And as far as we know, no one landed on the Galapagos Islands until the 16th century. It's possible that maybe people from South America have landed, but there's no current evidence. The first known recognition of the islands took place in 1535, when Fray Tomás de Palinga, who was the, the Spanish Bishop of Panama, was accidentally blown off course and he landed on the Galapagos Islands. They were there for a few days. He then went back home to Panama and he reported to his cartographers, his map makers, he reported that he'd found these islands and they went over and they mapped them very roughly. And that was the first time that anyone was aware of the Galapagos. Now we tend to think of these wonderful Pacific oceans as being beautiful palm covered white sanded beach uh, islands. But the truth is the Galapagos Islands are simply not that pretty. The Galapagos are volcanic. They're created by undersea volcanoes and some of the islands are nearly originally, they, they started building about 30 million years ago. Now the islands on the east side of the archipelago are the oldest. On the west side of the archipelago, they're still being formed. Volcanoes are still erupting. So the, the islands are still being created and they're moving. The whole archipelago is moving southeast at five centimeters a year. So in, in 20 million years time, they'll collide with, with South America. When you first see the Galapagos, they're a little disappointing because instead of the beaches being brilliant white sand, they're largely volcanic. You can see black rocks. The beaches aren't sandy, they're like grit. It's something you might dig out of the bottom of your fire when you're cleaning it out. They're not the idyllic um, desert islands of, of mythology because they're active. They are still being formed. Now, the reason why the Galapagos are created is that they're in what's called a hot spot. As you can see in this picture, the Galapagos are at the very top of the Nazca plate. These are the tectonic plates that make up the surface of the earth. The Galapagos formed where the Cocos, the Nazca and the Pacific plate meet. And where you get these meetings, there's a huge amount of volcanic activity. And for millions of years, the um, volcanoes were under sea and they erupt and very slowly, these eruptions would create lava flows. The lava flows would solidify and eventually they'd pop out of the surface of, of, of the sea. And erosion, sea erosion would damage this. So islands, as far as we know, have come and gone. The ones we can see now will be around for a few million years and they will erode. At the moment, there are 18 major islands and literally hundreds of, of much smaller islands and they are slowly shifting and it's a dynamic volcanic activity. The islands themselves effectively straddle the, the equator. The equator cuts through the top part of Isabella. And as you can see, there are several islands north of, of, of the equator. Now, in many other parts of the world, when you're on the equator, the conditions can be truly brutal. If you go to Central Africa in, in the middle of the summer, it's horrific. The weather conditions are simply hostile. The temperature can be around 50 degrees C. But in the Pacific Ocean and the Galapagos Islands, the weather is modified by the effect of the sea. Now, effectively, the Galapagos Islands are in what's called the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, not too cold. Although it's on the equator, 
the seawater keeps the, the weather, keeps the temperature much more moderate. The temperature in the Galapagos hardly ever reaches above 29, 30 degrees, even at the hottest period. And one advantage, if you're watching wildlife, is there are very few mosquitoes because the mosquitoes can't cross the water the 600 miles from the mainland of South America. Once the, um, the Bishop of Panama discovered the, the presence of the Galapagos Islands, they were largely ignored. There's nothing there to bring in people. There's no major resources, no gold. There's nothing there that anyone wanted. So for about 150, 200 years, they were largely ignored. No one was interested. Everyone knew they were there. And then the vile trade of whaling arrived. The whalers hunting sperm whales decided this was an excellent place to use as a base. Sperm whales are huge, the world's largest carnivores and they're often found in the North Pacific and the whalers used the Galapagos Islands as their base where they could repair their ships, they could go and find water and they simply exploited the, exploited the resources that were, that were on, on the island and many thousands of whales were dispatched by whalers based on, on the Galapagos Islands. Now the one advantage of the Galapagos is the cold water. Now as you can see there are many island currents here. The one at the very bottom is what's called the Humboldt Current. Now this is a massive ocean current that comes from the subantarctic. It surges up the west coast of South America and it brings with it very very cold water. Now cold waters are very rich in nutrients. They contain lots of, of, of food. So this produces a massive um, biomass, a large number of animals that live around the Galapagos, and a huge number of whales and sharks. There are more species of sharks around the Galapagos Islands than there are anywhere else. There is, however, one big disadvantage. You might imagine that because the islands are on the equator and the air temperature is lovely, you might think that the sea temperature is equally warm, but because of the Humboldt current, because of the current coming up from the, from the subantarctic, the water around the Galapagos is surprisingly cold. Now, I, I take people there and very often if you're on a boat and I'll say, does anyone want to go um, scuba diving or snorkeling? No, I do, I do, I do. And I'll be very careful because the water is colder than you think. And people will say, yes, that's fine, but I'm used to cold water. And they, they jump into the water and you can hear them go, ah! because it's so very cold. And it's the cold water that modifies the, the air temperature around the Galapagos. Now, as well as this being beneficial for this, the marine life in the Galapagos, there's also one huge advantage for the islands. Anything that drops into the water in South America, not just into the sea, but into the rivers that go into the sea, anything that drops into the sea will be carried by the northern currents, the southern currents, and they'll drift westwards towards the Galapagos. And obviously a huge number of um, flotsam items will miss the Galapagos and they'll just disappear into the vastness of the Pacific. But over millions and millions of years, lots of things that dropped into the water of South America, by coincidence, were carried by one of these currents that take it to the west they ended up at the Galapagos. And this has changed everything. It's changed the whole ecosystem of the Galapagos because nowadays what you can see are the descendants of animals that millions of years ago dropped into the water somewhere off the coast of South America and they managed to survive the 600 mile um, floating trip across the Pacific and landed on the Galapagos. We call them the Galapagos Islands, which means in Spanish, the island of tortoises. Millions of years ago, some tortoises deep inside the, um, the landmass in South America fell into the water. Some of them must have scrambled onto a floating log. The log bobbed into the sea, the sea current took them, and a certain number of them would have ended up in the Galapagos. Tortoises have a very slow metabolic rate. They're reptiles, they don't generate their own body heat. They can go a huge length of time without eating. 
and enough of them landed on the Galapagos to be able to generate a sustainable population. So over the years, they bred and they got bigger and bigger. They landed on um, a series of islands where there were no natural predators, no predators to control their population. And because tortoises live a very long time, we think that the Galapagos tortoises can live at least 150 years with no natural predators, they thrived, they did very well. Now this was in a way their downfall because the whalers who were basing themselves on, on the Galapagos Islands saw the tortoises as a resource. They hunted the tortoise. While they were on dry land, they ate tortoise. And when they were ready to leave, to go back into the ocean to search for whales, they captured the tortoises and they tied them upside down on the decks of their boats. Now, because tortoises have such a slow metabolic rate, they can go without eating or drinking for many, many months. And so very slowly, the whalers would eat their way through their captive tortoises. This had a disastrous effect on the population of, of tortoises, particularly on the east side of the archipelago, because the whalers came in from the South American mainland and they come in from the east and they decimated the population of tortoises. Even now, you can see the effects of, of the whalers 200 years ago. As you go further west towards Isabella, which is the, the, the furthest west island, the population of tortoises there is much more healthy because they weren't quite so uh, destroyed by, by the whalers. When you first approach the Galapagos, you imagine, say, um, white beaches and palm trees. But what you see are very, very low shrubs, very low trees. Because of the winds in the open ocean, you can't get huge trees. They, was, they simply can't withstand the wind. So there are forests there, but they're only three, four meters high, 10, 12 feet high. They're very short trees, but as you approach, what catches your imagination isn't the trees. What captures your imagination is the beach, the beach covered in black stones. And as you get closer, you realize that these black stones are moving. The rocks are moving because what you're seeing are marine iguanas. These are iguanas whose cousins still live in South America. They arrived on the Galapagos the same way as the tortoises did. They presumably traveled across on floating logs and they must have traveled across in fairly large numbers because now there are millions of marine iguanas. And these live on the tide line. They hunt, they eat under the water. And when they're not eating, they populate this, what's called the strand line on the beach. And as you approach, the whole beach appears to be moving. And what you're seeing are thousands and thousands of iguanas climbing over each other. Some are going into the water to feed, some are coming out of the water, they're going through their courtship ritual. These are the descendants of iguanas from the mainland that managed to survive the sea crossing. Now, if you look very carefully, amongst the marine iguanas, there are little flashes of orange. These are the Sally Lightfoot crabs, brilliant orange crabs about the size of a large apple. Now the word Sally Lightfoot apparently refers to a Peruvian dancer that appeared in some of the seedy nightclubs of South America. And when the sailors saw them, they saw the, the legs of the Sally Lightfoot crab resembled the dancer Sally Lightfoot who worked in Peru. Now these live on what's called the splash zone. They live between uh, the low water and the high water. They never leave the beach and they have astonishing grip. They can hold on to rocks while the surf breaks over them. And they just live on this zone where the surf crashes in over it. So you're looking at these rocks these rock-like iguanas are wriggling around and between them, these flashes of orange, the whole beach when you get close appears to be completely alive. But once you leave the beach and you start walking inland, you'll see another iguana. And this is a close relative of the marine iguana. It's called the land iguana. Now this is again, a descendant of the iguanas from South America that has evolved along a different path. Some of the iguanas 
adapted to life on the edge of the sea. They became marine iguanas, and some of them adapted to life on dry land. Now, although we can explain, you know, what happened, we can't explain why. You know, why did some turn into effectively land reptiles and others remained aquatic animals? One of the interesting things about evolution is you can often, you can follow the pattern and you can even fill in some of the gaps, but what you can't always explain is why. We're talking about one animal that diverted, that diverted into different, two different ways. The whalers and later the buccaneers and simply the, the explorers will often be away from home for, for many, many, many months. So a tradition um, appeared in the Galapagos. There's a, a barrel, a barrel on the, on the islands and anyone who wanted to write home to leave a letter would leave the letter in the barrel and any ship that was passing and going back to Europe or North America would collect the letters and deliver them when they were back in, in Europe or America. This still happens today. If you look very carefully, you can see on the top, uh, the, there's, a, there's a barrel with a roof on. This isn't the same barrel of 200 years ago, but it's still there. And when you're in the Galapagos Islands and you write a postcard, you can drop it into the barrel and some kind tourist will look at it and think, oh yes, I'm going back to Massachusetts or to Paris and they'll take it with them in the same way as the, the, the whalers and the buccaneers did 200 years ago. Humans had a terrible effect on the Galapagos. One of the worst things that ever happened is we discovered it. Now, the, the complete wiping out of, of tortoises was only the first step in a whole series of, of, of faux pas that we committed. People who went to the Galapagos in order to hunt tortoise eventually got fed up with tortoise meat and they knew that they would go back to the islands every two, three, four months and they wanted to vary their diet. So many ships decided to introduce a new food source. So they brought goats over from the mainland. They took live goats and released them into the islands. Uh, goats reproduce much faster than the tortoises so that they, they bred very, very quickly. Now, because they have a much higher metabolic rate, they eat more, they breed far quicker than tortoises, and slowly they started to effectively eat their way through the tortoises' habitat. Left to their own devices, the goats will completely destroy the ecosystem on the islands because they're eating what the, what the goats eat. The goats are eating what the tortoises eat. Tortoises and goats eat the same thing, they eat vegetation. So the Galapagos government, I'm sure you all know, the Galapagos is now controlled by Ecuador. The Ecuadorian government have decided in order to protect the ecosystem in the Galapagos, they have to wipe out the goats. So there are marksmen now that are slowly removing all the goats from the islands. Now that may sound a harsh thing to do, but unless the goats are controlled, the population of tortoises and the Galapagos will eventually disappear because they simply can't compete with an animal that eats more, is more aggressive, can move quicker and reproduces far faster. Not much happened between 1535 and 1835, Ecuador claimed ownership of the Galapagos Islands. And eventually, because no one wanted it, it had no actual value, Ecuador decided to use it as a prison. It was a large outdoor prison. And all the baddies from Ecuador were shipped over to the Galapagos. And if they survived, fine. If they died, that was okay as well. It was effectively a large outdoor prison, 1835. September, along came a ship called the Beagle, and it contained a young man, an amateur naturalist by the name of Charles Darwin. Darwin wasn't a zoologist. Darwin started life as a medical student, and he decided he didn't like surgery. He was a bit squirmish about blood. He then started to retrain as a, as a country vicar. He wasn't too keen on that either. So his father got him a job as an amateur naturalist on a boat called the Beagle. And in 1835, September the 15th, so we're almost at the 185th anniversary of Darwin arriving on the Galapagos, he landed. Darwin wasn't an arch conservationist. One of Darwin's real interests was eating the wildlife. When he was a student at Cambridge University, he ate tawny owls, cormorants, herons, 
he was passionate about eating wildlife. When he landed on the Galapagos, he too ate tortoise. But he had a very inquiring mind and he didn't just want to eat the wildlife, he studied it. And it's not difficult on the Galapagos because the animals there, they're not tame. They're absurdly tame. These are the tamest animals in the world. Now, I, I've worked all over the world, and normally when you're trying to photograph a wild animal, you have to be quiet. You move very slowly. If the animal turns and looks at you, you freeze. You try and keep your silhouette against a, a tree or a dry stone wall so you don't appear on the skyline. And when I first went to the Galapagos, I tried that using the normal techniques I would anywhere else. I remember approaching this, it's called the lava gull. It's the rarest gull in the world. There's only 220 pairs of these on the planet. And I thought, it's so rare, it has to be, it has to be timid. I remember creeping up very slowly on the lava gull. And next to me, around the corner, came a group of school children. They were shouting and whistling and they walked up to the lava gull and took pictures. These animals are extraordinarily tame because no one hunts them. So Darwin was able to study at very, very close range some of the tamest animals in the world. And there's one that caught his attention, the mockingbird. Now you can find mockingbirds in North America. But Darwin looked at these mockingbirds, a species he recognized, and he realized they were very slightly different. So the mockingbirds on one island, although it's the same species, look very different to a mockingbird on an island to the west of the archipelago. And he couldn't work out why. No, why on earth? It's the same animal coming presumably from the same ancestors. Why do they look so different? Darwin was on the islands for five weeks. Now most people that spend five weeks in the Galapagos come away with some very nice pictures and, and a suntan. Darwin came away with a theory that changed the history of science. Because Darwin, over observation and going away and thinking about it, began to realize that on each of the islands, the animals were very, very slightly different. Because the islands are at different ages, the ecosystem of each island is different. So if you have an island that's six million years old, it's been able to evolve a complex ecosystem with lots of plants that have been brought in by the wind or by the sea or on birds droppings. But if you have an island that's only a million years old, it hasn't had that time to develop a complex fauna. And therefore the ecosystems are, are very different. And Darwin looked at, at these animals and realized there were considerable differences, not just with, with mockingbirds, but with the tortoise. Now, if you look at this tortoise, it has a shell that's fairly high domed. Now this tortoise has a domed shell so it can lift its head and browse. Browsing means it feeds off leaves and it needs to do that on an island where there are shrubs and trees because leaves from trees provide a, a huge source of protein. Now, further west, there are islands where there are no trees because they haven't been around that long. And those tortoises don't have the dome shells. They have shells that come right down to the animal's head because these animals don't browse, they graze. They feed off ground plants. So that the tortoise's shell fitted that specific habitat, even though they came from the same source species millions and millions of years ago. And Darwin started to understand that each island had its own particular fauna, its own animals. And the animal that demonstrates this best of all are the finches. They're known now as Darwin's finches. And you can look at the, beach, at the beaks of finches and realize very quickly, although fundamentally they are the same animal, their beaks are different. You look at the beak of this finch, it's a tough, strong beak. It's designed to open shell um, seeds with really, really thick shells. This one is a generalist finch. This beak can't open very strong shells. And each island has its own beak design. The one on the top left, that's a beak that opens strong shells. It's a seed eater. 
the one on the bottom right, that can't open shells. This one feeds on, on insects because it lives on an island where there are no trees that produce seeds with strong shells. This beak is designed to winkle out little wriggly things amongst the stones. Darwin went away and it took him many, many years to work out why this was happening. And Darwin concluded, as I'm sure you all know, that over millions of years, these animals did not remain the same. They changed, they adapted. They, in order to survive, they changed not just their hunting mechanism, they changed their entire anatomy in order to be able to survive. This was the origin of Darwin's theory of evolution. I'm sure many of you will have seen this. It's supposedly a quote from Darwin. It isn't. However, it does encapsulate what Darwin meant. It does show you the theory of evolution. The survival of any species is not simple. Many, many factors come into play. Probably the, the most important factor is simply luck. Now, Dinosaurs didn't die out because they were inefficient. In fact, dinosaurs were incredibly efficient, highly adaptable. They died out because they were unlucky. If the meteorite that hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico had a, a track that was five degrees off in any direction it had, and missed the Earth, the whole story of life on Earth would have changed. Dinosaurs died out because they were unlucky. That's one part of it. Other aspects, other elements play a big part in, in survival, reproduction rate. But fundamentally, Darwin realized that it's not the survival, it's not the strongest of the species that survived, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. The phrase survival of the fittest, unfortunately, has come to mean the strongest, the boldest. That was never meant. What Darwin meant was the one who was most fitted to the habitat, the one that was able to survive. Now, we can't prove this, but we're pretty sure that many, many of the species of birds and mammals landed on, on, on the Galapagos Islands and they died out. They died out because they couldn't adapt. And sometimes that's just bad luck. If you're an animal that requires a tropical rainforest to survive and you land on an island like the Galapagos, you're doomed. You can't, you can't find breeding habitats, you can't find enough food. If 12 tortoises arrive on the island and they're all male, the species will die out. There's an element of luck, but fundamentally, it's the survival of those that can adapt. And the animals you can see now have adapted. This is a larva heron, and its adaptation comes in a color. If you're a heron that's bright yellow and you can find those in Africa, then the prey you're trying to catch can see you. But if you're a heron that's the same colour as the, the lava flows, your camouflage is so effective, you're much more likely to be successful at hunting. And evolution works by, you get a huge variation in any species. You get dark herons, light herons. The herons that are light won't hunt so successfully. They won't eat as much, they won't live as long, and they won't reproduce as much. Therefore, they won't pass on their light genes to the next generation. Darker herons will probably more, be more successful. They'll live longer, they'll pass on their genes to the next generation, and slowly over, over many, many years, the animals become darker. Now, very quickly, one of the last problems that humans introduced to the Galapagos affects the birds. These are birds called boobies. They're effectively gannets. This is the red-footed booby, and this is the red-footed booby's worst enemy, the rat, the black rat. When humans came, we introduced goats intentionally. We also accidentally introduced rats. And rats are what we call granivores. Normally, they eat cereals. But these, because they're so adaptable, they've turned slightly carnivorous. And these are hunting things like the boobies nest on the ground. They're eating the babies, they're eating the eggs. So humans have had a devastating effect on the natural history of, of the Galapagos. Now, I've been to the Galapagos many, many times and I have probably about 22,000 pictures. Now you think this talk was due to last for 35 minutes, but I hate to tell you, you're gonna be here till next November if you're going through all the slides. And sadly, we don't have time. So I hope I've introduced you to the Galapagos 
to the importance of them. They are now a world-class site. 98% of the Galapagos is devoted to the animals. Humans can go, but they can only go on 2% of the islands. The Ecuadorian government treats the Galapagos with true respect. They are doing everything they can to conserve these remarkable islands. Tourists can go, but they're controlled. The numbers are controlled and access to the land is, is controlled. It's one of the most fabulous places on earth. And of all the, the destinations I've been to, the Galapagos really have to be, for me, number one. So please read more about it. We can't do it justice in 35 minutes. So if there are any questions now, I'd be delighted to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This was totally fascinating. And of course, you know, I could be watching the, I mean, looking at those images for the rest of the day. I mean, so many interesting creatures and so many uh, fascinating details. We've actually received quite a few questions from our audience. So I'll just start with them, if that's okay. Please um, do. Quite, quite a lot of questions to do with, um, with, the, with some of the animals, as well as issues related to climate change, as well as geology. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that goes. So, um, there's a couple of kind of interesting questions about sort of camouflage and, and the way these um, various animals have evolved um, with and without predators. So there's a question from Bill there, uh, why are the iguanas so well camouflaged if there aren't any predators? That there are predators there now. And bear in mind, they are, they're not just land predators. The, the marine iguanas feed underwater. The males go much deeper than the females. So you have um, different strata of feeding. The females uh, feed much higher up than the males. The males go deep underwater and underwater there are sharks. Yeah. So it's not, it's, it, there aren't any foxes or stoats or anything, but in the water there are many, many predators. Um, so that um, the iguanas need to camouflage themselves in the water as well as out. And there are predators there, there just aren't very many. There's the Galapagos hawk, which is similar to our buzzard. There's the short-eared owl. And um, marine iguanas aren't, aren't, aren't that big. They're about 35 centimeters long. And when they're young, they can be picked off. Hmm. I suppose there'll be a similar uh, reply to the question, about why do the tortoises have such thick, um, thick shell, right? Because again, you know, in the water, they are quite exposed. The tortoises don't go into the water. It's the turtles go into the water. Sorry, the yeah. The land animal. When animals um, arrive on an island, there's a phenomenon called islandization that is not entirely understood. Some species become much bigger and some become much smaller, and we don't really fully understand the mechanism. Now, normally, when, when you get something like a tortoise, which is edible to lots of other animals, its population is controlled by predators. So there are tortoises over in the mainland in, in South America. But they're, they're, they're eaten by things like jaguars. Yeah. There's, there's no big cats on, 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 on the Galapagos. So with, with no predators, the animals are free to exploit the environment. And one of the things they do is, is to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, if you're going to, and they, a, a big tortoise can be 140 years old and weigh three times as much as a human. In order to sustain that mass, they need a very thick shell. Extreme. Just to be able to support their own body, it, effectively. It's effectively it is part of their skeleton. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, the the the, uh, the tortoises live a very long time, and there are some tortoises on Santa Cruz that have bullet holes in them, wow. where, they, where they were shot a hundred years ago by by people who uh, were hunting them for meat. Wow! Because their metabolism is so slow. If if I got shot, what would kill me largely is a shock because my metabolism would respond very badly to it. But if you're a tortoise, you can survive that sort of trauma. And so the, we've x-rayed some of the tortoises and you can see by looking at the bullets that these are bullets that haven't been used for 90 years. So wow. the tortoises have been carrying them around since the last century. That, that is, that is you know, and, and, and just that specific adapt, you know, in a sense, not adaptability, but you know, defense mechanism effectively, which is just this low metabolism, of course, has all sorts of other consequences as well. You know, you mentioned some already. Um, so, there's an like almost everything else in biology. There's an advantage and a disadvantage to a slow metabolism. It means they can survive periods of starvation very well. 
the, 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 the whalers understood very quickly, if you take a, a healthy tortoise, turn it upside down and tie it to a, a deck, it can go six months without eating or drinking. So wow. when they want to eat it, they'll kill it because they don't, they don't burn that much energy. When you listen to a tortoise heartbeat through a stethoscope, you hear a human, he goes, boom, boom, boom. You hear a hummingbird, he goes, because it's 400 beats per minute. Well, you listen to a tortoise, it goes, boom, boom. You know, everything wow. is very slow about the tortoise. Um, and so that, that helps them survive um, crossings of a thousand kilometers from the mainland of South America. It's yeah. one of the reasons why they managed to arrive on the Galapagos. Indeed. I mean, and they don't, they, I mean, they are relatively, I mean, they're not fast, obviously, they're relatively slow, but they're very aware, right? Yeah, they are. They don't take a lot of notice of the outside world because there are still, cats have been introduced. Cats are probably one of the most dangerous large predator on the islands, but they don't attack tortoises once they reach a certain weight. Tortoises have no, have no real enemies and they just, they just wander around minding their own business. And they're, they're very slow. Everything about them is terribly slow and they're lovely to watch. <laughs> That, that's brilliant. Now, do you think, I mean, this is an interesting question, somewhat relates to um, the changing climate, but also um, um, potentially in discovering new wildlife. Do you think that the loss of ice at the poles will reveal evidence of previously unknown creatures? There will be new things. Well, certainly not anything large. I'm sure you may have heard that um, they've just found bacteria. Yeah. In the, you know about the bacteria in the deep sea. Well, let's explain for everyone. And you're much more of an expert than I. I'm, I'm in physics mainly. <laughs> okay. Bacteria is, is, a, is a strange life form. It can survive. It appears to have no natural lifespan. But bacteria has been brought to life and it's 30,000 years old. So it's effectively it's been in suspended animation for 30, 30 million years, 30,000 30, years. It's unlikely we're going to discover any large vertebrates now. Yeah, the sad truth is we've discovered most. Every every so often we find a new a new bird. We're finding new invertebrates all the time, new beetles, new flyers. But the large mammals, largely the large invertebrates, have been have been discovered. So the, the problem isn't finding new species; it's wiping out the ones we already have. And with global warming, if global warming, without going too deeply into it, will result in a rise in sea levels. Yeah. Sea levels all over the world will rise and very low lying islands like the Maldives and the Galapagos will be swamped. So we're much more likely to lose animals as a result of this rather than to find any. I suppose similar variation also now occurs due to the El Nino effect and the impact of global warming on, on, the, on, this, on this phenomena. Is that, yeah. is that right? It is, yeah. El Nino effect is, is potentially worrying. We can't actually work out the likely patterns of change as a result of global warming. It's enormously complicated. I know supercomputers can't work out what's going to happen, but we do know that as the Earth gets warmer, weather patterns change. We've had an extraordinary um, summer here in Europe, and it's happening literally all over the world. It will have an effect. It will change things like ocean currents. So if, say, the Humboldt current changes, it only has to change by 10 degrees. Instead of going up to the Galapagos, if it starts swinging west before it reaches the Galapagos, it'll change the entire ecosystem because the temperature of the Galapagos is controlled by the cold water in the sea. If that water warms up, everything changes on the island because it's, it's a giant radiator that can cool the islands or heat them up. So changes yeah. in, 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 um, in global warming like that are potentially lethal. Indeed, indeed. Um, excellent, I, I think we're just getting to the time unfortunately this was absolutely fascinating i mean i, I really really enjoyed it and uh, as i say i could be looking at these pictures uh, on and on and on and um and we'll ask you michael if you just sort of once we sort of sign off if you sort of stay on the line so we can thank you properly on behalf of the orkney science festival i'll do this publicly first thank you so much michael for this fascinating talk uh, i think we managed to go through most of the questions but if anybody's got any particularly you know important questions that we haven't managed to touch upon um i, I believe um contact details for michael and he's got other opportunities to sort of come and speak as well as do um um other things uh, are in the in the are posted in the chat um also in the chat should be details about a couple of uh further events uh, in particular uh, just in a few minutes we'll start our daily 
uh, P.D. Kirk lunch. And this will be the, lunch, the last P.D. Kirk lunch of the Orkney International Science Festival, because, of course, today is the last day of, of the festival. Uh, I believe there are still some tickets available for that. Um, and as I say, they will appear down, um, the links will appear down in, in the chat. As well as we'd like to invite you to tonight's traditional uh, closing Kaylee for the Orkney International Science Festival. Um, again, I think details are, um, are um, appearing in the chat and also on the Orkney Science Festival website. Uh, we hope as many of you as possible will join us uh, to toast uh, not just Michael, but all the amazing speakers we've had um, over, over uh, the past week. Of course, uh, the Science Festival is not over yet. Uh, unfortunately, the talk at two o'clock has been cancelled. Uh, so the next talk for the Science Festival programme is going to be at 3.30 today, um, and it's titled The Mason, the Tsar, and the Dry Docks of Sevastopol. So uh, something to tune in uh, there. Uh, of course, if you're enjoying a Science Festival uh, program, please feel free to like us on uh, Facebook as well as follow our YouTube channel. Uh, but for now, um, all that remains to be said is thank you again, Michael, for this fascinating talk. Um, and we're really very much looking forward uh, to more adventures and many more of those pretty pictures. Uh, well, so thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, and goodbye.